Hey everyone, it's Victoria with Nutrition by Victoria. I have a master's of science in human nutrition and I'm here to help you build a high functioning metabolism so that you can get and stay effortlessly slim, lean, fit and healthy, all while eating an unlimited amount of carbohydrates. That is what I have achieved for myself. And that is what I'm here to help you do as well. So this is what I currently look like at six months or seven months postpartum. Um, and this is my latest video. I just uploaded it yesterday. When will you start losing weight? And there was a comment left at the bottom here that I'm going to answer today in a reaction video. Uh, so I'm going to be reacting to Dr. Brooke Goldner's hyper nourishing omega-3 protocol today. So it it's going to be a good one. All right. This says, Brooke Goldner says that consuming large quantities of omega-3s is what causes repair and healthy weight loss. She also says to eat an unlimited amount of avocados. This is causing people to get confused as your message is quite opposite. Will you critique this video she did on the topic? And that's what I'm going to critique today. I just want to go through the rest of the uh, comments that were left on this thread here. I said Dr. Peter Rogers and her should have a debate. Pete is on team no overt fats. Um, I did an interview with him on High Carb Regenerator's channel. Um, and we have a very similar take on nutrition. Uh, and then it says, I agree, but Dr. Goldner won't. She cherry picks her interviews and avoids confrontation. I think you should help to expose that video to your subs by doing a reaction video. Okay, that's what I'm here to do today. Uh, Dr. Goldner's protocol is terrible for weight loss if you're hypernourishing. Say you eat the omegas and vegetables on top of a starch-based diet and some avocado, you'll run into problems i.e. insulin resistance, and they'll blame the starches. Yes, carbs always get blamed for insulin resistance, even though we've learned, if you've been watching my channel, insulin resistance is primarily due to under-eating carbohydrates and eating too much fat. And then it says, Dr. Goldner always says that starches and sugar cause inflammation and to avoid them. What are you left with? A hypocaloric diet destined to implode. Because people get hungry right? Uh, so I highly doubt that the success rate uh, long-term of people following her protocol is uh, very good as she uh, promotes a low-carb plant-based diet that's high in fat. Yet she claims success due to her test of results. I've tried to talk to her about these topics, but refuses to engage. Apparently she only talks to those who have paid to be in her coaching programs. Um, and so my response just to the sugars and uh, starches causing inflammation, um, they all, carbs always get blamed, um, but insulin sensitivity is dependent on eating sufficient carbohydrates and keeping the diet low in fat. So of course, if her program is going to be high in fat, it's going to need to be low in carb in order to decrease inflammation. But let's go ahead and watch this video now um, and uh, I will critique it. and chia seeds have the highest dose of omega-3s in the plant world that you can find. Uh, and she is right about that. Um, I consider flax and chia to be like overt sources of omega-3 fatty acids, but they're not the only ones. In fact, if you eat a diet that is sufficient in calories, you'll meet your uh, requirement for omega-3 fatty acids very easily. They are primarily omega-3. So I use those as a rapid way of replacing it, right? My question though, is she testing people for omega-3 fatty acid deficiency? Because you can actually do this. And if you are just overloading somebody's system with omega-3 fatty acids, um, wouldn't you want to see if there is a um, deficiency first? Because uh, the problem isn't that most more often than not, the problem isn't that people have too many omega-3 or omegas, <laughs> that people are deficient in omega-3s is usually not the problem. The problem is people are consuming foods that are uh, contain a lot of omega-6. And so when those ratios are off, um, it should be about a one to three ratio of omega-3s to omega-6s in order to be anti-inflammatory in our body. But when, you know, people are eating all these oils and animal products, then their omega-6s go way up and then inflammation goes up as well. Um, so it's not necessarily that people are deficient in omega-3s, it's that their um, diet is too high in omega-6. 
interesting about flax and chia seeds. Mm -hmm. um, and I know I get it, and I understand that they are omega threes. But why are they so important, and how does that affect um, you know your body in, in, in healing? Omega three fatty acids are supposed to be a part of your cellular membrane. So everyone. Yeah, so our cellular membrane is called a phospholipid bilayer, and it is made up of fatty acids. Um, so that's what she's about to talk about now. And it basically allows it so that we're not like a puddle. <laughs> we have um, structure to our cells uh, so that um, nutrients can move in and out of the cells and, you know, waste can be removed while nutrients go in, et cetera of us is made of cell, right? And on the inside of our cells is all water soluble stuff, right? Okay. Then we have a membrane around each cell that has fats in it, right? To Okay, so she's just explaining that there. And she's basically saying that omega 3s, you know, are necessary for the structure of our cells. So we have um, essential fatty acids that we, we must, you know, consume in our diet in order for us to be healthy and to meet those essential fatty acid requirements. But our essential fatty acid requirements are very, very low, about 2% of our diet, right? And so when we're eating, just plant foods, they all contain, um, you know, small amounts of fats in them, especially like high carb, low fat plant foods, which most plant foods are by default, um, the ones at least that you're going to be finding in nature and wanting to consume the fruits and the starches, right? They're all going to be containing varying amounts of the essential fatty acids, but in small amounts, right? It's kind of like nature designed for us to be uh, high carb, low fat eaters because our uh, cells require glucose in order to create energy, right? So uh, it's only natural that we're going to be able to meet our fatty acid requirements by eating those foods as well. So um, the essential fatty acids are omega-3s and omega-6s. And just by default, by consuming a high-carb, low-fat diet, you're going to be consuming a uh, the omega-3 or the essential fatty acids in the correct ratios. Keep, and, and one side of it is all, it, it, it's called a phospholipid. It's fat on the outside, water dissolvable on the inside around our cells. We would just dissolve. Like we'd get right. wet and then we'd be a puddle ourselves. Mm -hmm. One of the fats that are important in that membrane is supposed to be omega-3 fatty acids. Now, okay. typically, if we, if we went back to like tribal humanity, where we were walking around through the forest, we would be eating mostly things that grow on trees and bushes, right? right. We'd be eating mostly fruits and roots. <laughs> That's what we would do. That's what we did. Right. right. Mostly green stuff, because when you look around, everything's mostly green, right? No, we wouldn't be walking around eating mostly green stuff. That's what cows and horses do. <laughs> That's what herbivores naturally do. That's what they're designed to do. Uh they're, you know, they have a different uh dentation and they have different um stomach <laughs> anatomy uh that allows for them to turn uh very low calorie uh grass into energy for their bodies we don't easily do that we don't break down greens very well in fact most of it just ends up in the toilet right um even if you um I mean, unless you're like making it into a smoothie or something where you're able to better access the nutrition that is in the greens, but they're not a reliable energy source. And most of them too are toxic to humans. So um, you have to, like I grow greens, right? So um, you have to pick them at the right time in order for them to be palatable and also um, nutritious and not toxic to the system. A lot of greens are bitter. So the bitter taste makes us like not want to eat them. Um, if something is sweet or savory, then we're going to want to consume it naturally in nature. Uh, so we would be seeking out fruits, which are going to have carbohydrate, taste sweet, and we'd be seeking out tubers, which, you know, when we cook them are going to deliver the same um, taste response from our taste receptors, right? Ooh, this tastes good. And um, it's also going to, you know, those foods are going to be the foods that provide energy to our cells in the form of carbohydrate. And then occasionally you're like, oh my God, a fruit tree. And then you'd eat some fruit, right? Like, but you don't walk around and see fruit everywhere you look, right? It's green. <laughs> That's great. You know, she's referring to, you know, fruits and greens are healthy and they're definitely make up like a, a healthy human diet. Right. But we did not really advance as a human society until we started uh, cultivating starches on a level that could support um, a growing population. So you'll 
if you go back in history books, you'll notice, you know, when we started growing corn and we started growing wheat and rice and potatoes, that's when we were able to support a a more advanced society that was capable of um, supporting a higher uh, number of people in terms of population. So and that's just something to keep in mind that, you know, we thrive on carbohydrates. Uh, we've thrived as a society on carbohydrates. Uh, this um, famine, you know, feast and famine situation that she is referring to is um, not something that supported um, a high population level. And, it, you know, a lot of this is theoretical, too, that she is um, referencing. Greens and greens and vegetable greens and oh bananas right and then so so right. we were doing that we would have okay I'm gonna move forward a little bit here omega six I was talking about those two parts of the immune system because there's actually some omega threes even in greens but a little bit all right. And she's right. There are omega uh, threes in greens. Actually, if you're talking about foods that are low in fat, right, the greens are going to be the best source of omega threes. But they're found in everything, uh, all plant foods. Um, and those omega three fatty acids, though, when they're part of our cell membrane, they make our membrane very flexible and receptive to signals. So we have a nice flexible membrane that can do like a catcher's mitt. I would think of it, right? Like it can squeeze. So. Now, this again is like a hypothetical situation. Our membrane flexibility is already going to be present um, naturally with this phospholipid bilayer in this liquid center, right? Um, what she is referring to right now is actually insulin sensitivity where nutrients can move in and waste can move out. Um, and that would be due to the fact that... Um, insulin sensitivity is generally a non-inflammatory situation. So if there's a signal that comes along and this signal says, I've been working out like crazy, I want to lose fat, the signal comes and the catcher's mitt catches it and it releases fat. Okay, that's not how fat loss works at all. <laughs> um, I mean, we're always burning fat, right? Fat burns in the flame of carbohydrates. So when you're taking in sufficient carbohydrates, uh, you're also able to burn fat, um, whether it's through the fat that's coming in through the diet or fat that is on your body. Um, ideally, the best fat burn situation is going to happen when you're insulin sensitive, high carb, low fat diet, right? Another signal comes along, we have some inflammation to repair. I'd like you to repair it. It catches it. It does the job. Most people nowadays don't really eat omega-3 sources. The black to chia seeds have the highest dose of omega-3s in the plant world that you can find. Yeah. The other thing I want to mention, though, she's saying that these foods have the highest um, source of omega-3s. So like I said, they're overt fat sources of omega-3s. Where in nature are you going to find these seeds just like this plentiful, right? If you've ever grown chia or flax seeds, right, um, they sprout into a grass. So these are grass seeds. You, you're you not just going to go and like dig up a bunch of grass seeds and be like, oh, I, I these are what I want to eat, right? Like, so the whole, I guess what I'm trying to say here is when she was saying that like living in the Garden of Eden, right, fruits and greens, we're not going to be just like eating seeds. Like, and when you're talking about nuts, nuts are going to be, you know, very sparse. They are very seasonal, um, but they're hard to access as well. So what we are designed to eat is fruits and starches, not greens and seeds, which is what her diet is based on. They are primarily omega-3. So I use those as a rapid way of replacement, right? So if you don't have omega-3s, your body uses the second best, which would be omega-6. Omega-6 is in meat, dairy, oils, processed foods. Okay, so she's right here, okay? Uh, when we don't have enough omega-3, we are going to be, you know, using omega-6. But mo in most people's diet, it's not an omega-3 deficiency. It's that they're eating too much omega-6. So it creates an inflammatory situation from the meat and the dairy and the oil and the processed foods that are high in fat, right? Sugar doesn't cause inflammation. It's a high-fat diet that causes inflammation, okay? 
So these foods all create insulin resistance. So like I said, we're not dealing with deficiency here. We're dealing with too much fat, inflammatory fats in the diet. So with most people's diet constant, right? right. So their cells are full of omega-6 instead. Now omega-6 makes a cell stiff. Again, what she's referring to is inflammation that is primarily generated from an insulin resistant situation from the high fat foods. If the cell is stiff, signals that come along will bounce off and never be received, and that toxins get trapped inside as well. Okay. With the omega 3, now that's not necessarily the case. Yes, the body doesn't work as well when it is dealing with insulin resistance. Um, you know, it's going to be harder for glucose to get into the cell and harder for waste to come out. And what can happen is a ketoacidosis situation where, you know, the sugar is staying in the blood because it can't get into the cell because of the insulin resistance. So then you have a lot of inflammation present and then you have um, the cells um, turning to ketosis in order to generate energy so that they don't die off. Um, and then the top, the, ketone bodies are going to get trapped in the cell. And then you have just like a, a really bad situation. People who have diabetic ketoacidosis can lose limbs due to um, necrosis, which is basically cell death, tissue death. But when it's a stiff, hard membrane, toxins stay trapped inside, nutrients can't get in, signals can't dock. And now... So she's basically saying here that this is all because there's an omega-3 deficiency and um, people are eating too much omega-6, but that's not the case. What this is, is insulin resistance versus insulin sensitivity. Um, and the reason why her protocol being like low calorie, low carb works, right, is because you're taking the sugar out. So the inflammation is decreasing, right? Um, but that is not like a long-term solution to this problem. What you want is to do high carb, low fat, make sure that there are no overt fats, that omega-6 level is low in comparison to omega-3s. And we are going to look at some chronometer data coming up here after this video. Again, you have a sick cell. It's getting poisoned with toxins. It can't get nutrition. It can't get any of the results. And so therefore, you're not going to be able to move forward, not going to get healthy, right? Okay, so the majority of people too that she's working with, and let's just be honest, the majority of people that are walking around right now have a degree of insulin resistance from the diet that they're consuming. So um, I want to just show now a little clip of the interview that I did with Dr. Peter Rogers talking about Brooke Goldner's uh, diet program. Potatoes make them fat, you know, pasta makes them fat, yeah. all of it. And it's just really awful to see like, and then the ve there's a vegan keto now, I know. you know, I it's mean, like it's a thing. Goldner. <laughs> yeah, I know. And people always ask me, well, is this what I should be doing? And I'm like, yeah. no. <laughs> yeah. My impression of that was like, let's say you have somebody who's got autoimmune disease. My first approach would be avoid everything that can cause leaky gut. <clears throat> there's a list of about 20 things. I would avoid all those things. Try to have a healthy gut, if you will. There's a couple of toxins that also appear uh, capable of causing autoimmune disease, things like fluoride, for example, things like glyphosate. I would avoid all of those things. And once I've done that, if the autoimmune disease still was not resolved, you could potentially consider taking all those omega-3s. But I wouldn't go right to that because the omega-3s, I think they're not as bad as the rheumatology medications, these really powerful uh, autoimmune suppressants, things like methyltrexate and whatnot. That's like chemotherapy for cancer. OK, so I wouldn't jump right to that. I would. Most people are probably going to get better. I heard one time this guy, I think his name is Esser, Steve Esser or something. He's a pretty well-known nutrition guy. Um, he said in his experience, about 85% or more patients will get better when you just do some of the basic stuff, eat more fiber, avoid the common causes of leaky gut. But only in, so what I'm saying is in that context, I would eat more of those omega-3s, kind of like the Goldner thing, but I wouldn't go right to it. Um, and I would, but I would try that for methotrexate. It's sort of like my thinking out of autoimmune diseases. Well, they can also test for omega-3 levels as well to see if you're actually deficient so that it would be something that would be beneficial too. Yeah, I would be careful though because how they define it because yeah. you can just a definition because <laughs> what you got to do is you got to make everybody think they got a deficiency and then you can sell them your, your supplement, yeah. you know? 
Um, but even within that. Okay, so that's essentially what Goldner's doing. You know, she's making people think that they have an omega-3 fatty acid deficiency. Um, and she's saying, hey, this program works for if you have an autoimmune condition. And that's what Dr. Um, Rogers was talking about. But he's saying that first, like, take all those inflammatory foods out of the diet, because most autoimmune conditions are um, inflammatory disease, right? And they're exacerbated, the symptoms are exacerbated by inflammation. So wouldn't it make sense to remove the inflammatory components out of the diet, eat, you know, your fruits, your starches, your vegetables, um, your legumes, if you desire them, add sugar, if you, you know, want to include it in your diet. Um, but focusing on that should, you know, fix the problem, right? And then he said, if it doesn't, you know, considering the omega-3 supplementation, but that's why I said, why wouldn't you test for omega-3 um, fatty acid deficiency before, um, adding that much fat to your diet. So now we're going to go ahead and look at chronometer data, but he said, you know, obviously what Dr. Goldner is doing is better than what the pharmaceutical industry has to offer. So, and you know, doctors aren't talking about this information either, but we are, uh, what I did here is I plugged in some numbers for what I, think could be a day of eating on Dr. Brooke Goldner's diet, right? So we got three tablespoons of chia seeds, three tablespoons of flax seeds, five avocados, you know, unlimited avocados, a whole head of lettuce, uh, romaine lettuce, and some lentils. I just threw them in just because I can take them out too. Uh, actually, I'll take out the lentils here. Um, and what we're left with is 1500 calories. Uh, and this is not a keto diet because I believe in order for a diet to be keto, it needs to be under 40 grams of carbs. So this would put somebody in gluconeogenesis all the time where you're having to, um, you know, break down muscle protein basically because this protein intake is only 30 grams. So not, not only is this def diet deficient in carbohydrates, uh, but it's also deficient in protein. So this diet style is going to be uh, telling your body, hey, there is not enough glucose available. So we need to create it from uh, muscle tissue um, because there's not enough protein coming into the diet. Um, and then we also, you know, are going to be turning some of this fat into energy as well. So 124 grams of fat in three tablespoons of chia seeds, three tablespoons of flaxseed, and five avocados, okay? For a hypocaloric diet of only 1,500 calories. I would feel sick eating this diet, um, but that is an exorbitant amount of fat. This diet Again, we're removing the sugar, so we're not having um, blood sugar issues, right? But this diet is priming somebody to be insulin resistant. So there is still insulin resistance presence here. Uh, there's just not enough sugar coming into the diet for the inflammation from this um, insulin resistance to be um, present, right? So, so it's like you are basically putting the bear to sleep. You're in a hibernation mode when it comes to having um, inflammation due to um, blood sugar imbalance, which is the majority of what people are dealing with when they have inflammation is they're insulin resistant. But as soon as you start eating, like the other comment that said, well, when you add, you know, a starch-based diet with this um, hyper- nourishment program, you're going to be dealing with symptoms of insulin resistance. You're going to be dealing with inflammation. So in order for her diet to work, somebody has to eat low carb, right? But is that sustainable? It's not. Okay. So let's just go down to, uh, so even Cronmeter is saying this is too, way, way too much fat. Okay. We got 11 grams of omega-3s and we still have 14 grams here of omega-6s. It's too much omega-6 still, okay? So I'm going to show you another um, chronometer data of a high-carb, low-fat diet, okay? So we got dates, bananas, white rice, apples, some seaweed, which is a good source of... Um, omega-3 fatty acids and romaine lettuce here. So um, you can see uh, now we've got 4,000, you know, 3,800 calories here, 10 grams of fat, 
65 grams of protein, which is going to be more sufficient than the previous diet we just looked at, and 934 grams of net carbs. We're also meeting more of our nutrients here, if you can see. Look at all that green. Oh, we're almost at calcium, right? 98%. Um, B12, 85% without even consuming a supplement. Um, folate's in the red. And let's just go back here. You know, we're barely meeting any of our nutrient requirements here, you know, in comparison to this day. Okay. Also, I want to just go through. So this is the low carb vegan diet, the Brooke Goldner protocol. Okay. Um, you know, so it looks, looks decent for nutrient intake, you know, but protein's real low. That's why I had added those lentils originally. Okay. Because I'm sure people are eating more than just, you know, what I have on there, but it's way too low in carbohydrate. And then you can see this diet, you know, more, more in the green, it's more nutrient dense, this style of a diet, a high carb, low fat diet. And I just want to show the omega threes here. We got 1.3 grams of omega-3s um, and 1.6 grams of omega-6. And we're almost at, we're at 97% for the omega-3 intake. And it shows where you're getting the majority of it from. The lettuce, the bananas, the white rice, and the apples, okay? And then, like I said, even the seaweed, but it's so, you know, little in caloric intake to really show up on there, uh, is contributing to the, um, omega threes as well. Um, but that lettuce, you know, like she, like Brooke had said, um, greens are a really good source of omega threes, but this, this style diet, the high carb, low fat diet is going to be more sustainable, is going to provide you with the omega-3s that you need. It's going to keep the omega-6s low. It's going to down-regulate inflammation, and it's going to provide the body with more nutrition. So really, whose diet is hyper-nourishing? Is it a high-carb, low-fat diet that's sufficient in calories and carbohydrates, or is it the Brooke Goldner style diet, okay, where you're barely getting any carbs, you're barely getting any protein, really, and you're getting too much fat, okay? This is unsustainable. This diet, this low-carb diet, uh, low-carb vegan diet that's low in calories, high in omega-3s, is creating insulin resistance where you could be eating a high-carb, low-fat diet and meeting all of your nutrient needs, including maintaining that healthy ratio of omega-3s to omega-6s. So that's it for this video. I hope that you guys got a lot out of it. Uh, leave any comments or questions down below. Thank you so much for the video request, and I will see you guys next time. Oh, and also uh, there's a link for my coaching in the description box if you're interested. Okay, I'll see you guys next time. Bye.